Welcome to another RetroNAS video. In this video, we're going to install a Debian 11 VM virtual machine, uh, and we're going to configure that to give ourselves admin access or sudo access uh, and root privileges. Um, this is something that differs a little bit from a Raspberry Pi uh, with the Raspberry Pi OS, but essentially we're going to build a similar environment to uh, what a Raspberry Pi would offer in a virtual machine so that you can either test RetroNAS or use it through a virtual machine directly. We're going to go through the process of installing Debian 11. Debian 11 is the currently only supported distribution for RetroNAS. Um, so if you're new to Linux, Linux comes in different flavors or different distributions. Uh, they do slightly different things in the way they roll stuff out. Uh, I'm aiming to make RetroNAS more uh, distro agnostic in the future to make it run on as many different systems as possible. Uh, but for now, I'm targeting Debian 11, mostly because that's the distribution that Raspberry Pi OS is based on. So if you can run it on Raspberry Pi OS, that's the sort of the, the goal for simple computing. Uh, but then Debian 11 is something that you can run on any old computer or a virtual machine or whatever. So we're going to go through the process here of uh, two things. Firstly, installing Debian 11, and then secondly, uh, enabling uh, root and sudo. And I'll go through those later on. I'll put bookmarks down below. If you, if you don't need this bit, please jump to the bit that you do need. The first thing you'll need is a virtualization platform if you want to virtualize it. You can use whatever you want. Uh, I'm going to run uh, VirtualBox today. Now, the reason for VirtualBox uh, is that... Um, it's operating system agnostic. Um, I've just gone to the to the downloads page here. If you go to the main page, uh, you just get this big download VirtualBox button. Click it, and it'll take you to the download page. Pick your host. Uh, it'll run on all these different platforms. Uh, I am currently sitting on a Windows 11 desktop just to sort of show the Windows approach. Um, normally, I use Linuxy stuff, but uh, I'll sit in this today just maybe for a more familiar interface for most people. Uh, so download and install that. I've already done that. I've got VirtualBox running. Uh, once you've got VirtualBox installed, head to the Debian website, debian.org. Uh, likewise, hit the big download button. It'll take you to this uh, download page. Uh, and if you wait a few seconds, it'll prompt you straight away to grab uh, the Debian 11 um, um, installer. It'll grab, you'll see it here, it'll say AMD64. Now, uh, in... Linux terms, Linux likes to talk about the architecture of your CPU. So AMD64 is a type of CPU. It doesn't mean you need an AMD CPU. You can run it on any Intel or AMD 64-bit CPU. That's That refers to an architecture, not a brand. Um, i386 is the 32-bit version. So we're gonna grab the 64-bit version today. I've already downloaded it. Uh, just, you know, follow your nose, download that. It's going to grab this net installer. So that is, it's quite small. I think it's about 300 megabytes. Um, it's just enough to get the OS installed and it will reach out to the internet to grab bits, extra bits, if you want to install those. So once you've got those downloaded, so VirtualBox installed, again, use whatever you like. If you don't want to use VirtualBox, if you want to use VMware, if you want to put this on a real machine, uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, there are instructions here on how to turn the CD into a USB stick. So you can grab that ISO image, you can burn it to a physical uh, CD or DVD media if you've got an old computer that's got optical drives. Uh, Blu-ray as well, it says apparently. Uh, or you can uh, turn it into a USB stick uh, image. There's plenty of different ways to do that. They show you some guides here. Uh, there's tools like uh, Rufus or Etcher. I might put some links in uh, underneath the video. You can go and use those and turn those into USB sticks if you want. I won't go through that now. I'll just go through the virtual machine approach. So with the ISO downloaded, open up VirtualBox and you'll be greeted with the VirtualBox interface. We're going to create a new virtual machine by clicking the new button. Uh, now I'm going to type in just the word Debian here and you'll notice that it automatically picks up that it's Linux and it's Debian of 64-bit um, Linux type. It'll show you the little Debian icon here, the swirl with a 64. So uh, it's, it's automatically picked that. If not, choose that from the drop down. There's heaps of different options here. Uh, I'm just going to stick with this uh, Debian Linux option here. 
Give it some RAM. Um, now by default, it'll be really conservative. You can put in whatever you like. Um, I find sort of two gig-ish is a decent size to test things. And that's kind of in the realm of what a Raspberry Pi is anyway. Uh, you can change this later. Uh, this is not hard set. You can definitely add or subtract RAM later, simply power down the virtual machine, change the memory allocation, power back up, and it's all ready to go. You don't have to configure anything in the operating system. We're going to choose a hard drive. Uh, again, I'm just going to go with the defaults here. You can do whatever you like. You can customize this as far as you want. You can change whatever allocations. You can give it more space, less space, whatever. I'm just going to follow the defaults kind of just to, to prove a point and to get through this pretty quickly. I'm going to create a VDI type. Again, all these uh, disk types there for different virtualization platforms, compatibility with VMware, etc. Uh, if you are using VMware, you know, follow the standard steps for creating uh, virtual disks there. I'm going to choose the defaults here. Uh, dynamically allocated versus fixed. So that's whether or not the disk uh, resizes to how much space is used on disk. Again, I'm just going to go with the defaults. Uh, how much space do you want and where do you want to put the actual image? Again, I'm going defaults, you set whatever you like there. Right, now we've got a virtual machine defined and you can see in this right hand side here in quite a small font, unfortunately, uh, all the different options. I'm going to configure a couple of different things. So I'm going to hit the settings button up here. And then in the menu, uh, there's a few things I want to change. I'm going to go to the system menu uh, and the processor tab. Now it'll assign one CPU. I recommend at least two. Um, the reason for that is um, virtualized systems, especially modern operating systems. So this is a modern Linux, it's not an old Linux. Uh, work really well under multi CPU. They can assign, especially when you're doing disk or write heavy operations, it's nice to have at least two CPUs, one for sort of compute stuff and one to handle the, what we call IO, so the network and disk stuff. Um, general sort of consensus on any virtualization is uh, make it half or lower of your uh, available CPUs if you're doing desktop stuff as well. Uh, but again, I recommend at least two, I'm gonna give four just for the heck of it. Um, on the storage section, uh, I've got my virtual SATA disk with my virtual SATA drive in my um, disk here, my uh, optical drive. I'm going to click choose a file and I'm going to choose my uh, Debian net installer that I've downloaded. So that's going to put that ISO in and present it to the virtual machine as an optical drive that it can boot off. Under my network settings, uh, I'm going to enable my network. Now by default, uh, VirtualBox, I don't know what VMware does, I think it does the same thing. It wants to do what's called a NAT, that stands for Network Address Translation. What that does is it creates a virtual network behind your host operating system, in my case, this Windows box, uh, and that will translate back to a different IP address. So all your virtual machines will then, they'll route through. The, your, your host operating system essentially works like a router, like your home broadband router, for example, um, and goes out to the internet that way. That's fine. And it's very uh, compatible. And it means if you're switching networks, it works without any hiccups or anything like that. The downside is that uh, the virtual machine can get out, but it's difficult for things to get back into the virtual machine without port forwarding and all sorts of weird network weirdness. So we're going to change that because of what RetroNAS is, because it's, it's all about sharing data. And we're going to change that to a bridged adapter. So what that will do is it essentially turns your uh, laptop or your, your host machine, I'm on a laptop, you could be on a desktop, uh, it turns that into like a network switch and it makes the virtual machine see the entire network as if it was physically plugged into the network um, or, you know, connected via Wi-Fi or whatever. So I'm going to choose my main, you might have a couple of different ones. Um, I've obviously got a, a gigabit Ethernet adapter in physically inside my laptop, but I'm connected currently by Wi-Fi to my network. So that's important. I need to bridge off the active connection. Uh, you can see my Wi-Fi down the bottom right there in the, in the status bar connected. I'm going to choose that adapter. Uh, you don't have to do this. I'm going to click on the advanced tab. You can choose the what the virtual network card looks like. Um, Linux will literally work with 100% of these options here. Any one of these you present to Linux, it'll say, yeah, I know that and define a driver. The fastest one and the lowest overhead one is this para, para virtualized network. Um, so that's a special virtual network card that was written by Red Hat, who's a, a prominent um, Linux 
company uh, and it's very very lightweight and very very fast uh, and excellent if you are running uh, Linux virtual machines um, again you can choose anything you like I'm going to choose that one uh, and then the last thing back to system again uh, back to the motherboard uh, I've got options of what to boot from. I'm just going to disable the floppy and make sure the optical disk is the first option in order. So it's going to attempt to boot optical. If that's got nothing in it, boot hard drive. Um, I'm going to leave that in that order. So that's similar to like if you were configuring your BIOS on a real computer to make sure you booted from optical or USB first before the local hard drive so that you can run an installer. So that's that. I'm going to leave all that set. You can confirm all the options here. So there's my, I uh, gave it a little bit over 2 gig of RAM, 4 processors. Uh, you can see the IDE drive is in there and that I've got a power virtualized bridged uh, network adapter. So they're, they're the key things to make the virtual machine work in a way that you would want for RetroNAS. If you were doing just testing Linux for some other reasons, you might choose some different options and that's totally fine. These options will work well if you want to test RetroNAS on your real network with real computers doing real things. All right, with that done, double click to start the VM. It'll pop up and asking what do you want to do? We're going to go 100% defaults here. Choose the graphical install. Now this next bit might take a while. It's got to probe hardware and things. Uh, a long time ago, Linux would give you walls of text telling you what it was doing. Uh, apparently that scares people. Uh, so these days they remove the walls of text and give you a black screen, which I think is very annoying. Uh, I would much prefer a wall of text. At least I know something's happening. But if you just sit here for a minute, it will detect all your hardware and get to the next step. All right, language selection, I'm going to choose English. Where are you in the world? I'm just going to type in the first couple of letters of my country so that I can find it in the menu and select it. Uh, choose your keyboard. I've got a US English keyboard, which will be the default for uh, most English speaking countries, I think, probably not the UK, but. Right, so it'll install a few bits and pieces that it needs to make the installer work. It'll then, I'm just going to hover off the cancel button there, it'll detect my network. So uh, because I'm on a bridged network, it's going to uh, use DHCP and it's going to pick up, pick up an IP address from my home uh, DHCP server. So I've got a dedicated DHCP server. If you've got like a broadband router or something like that, it might have a DHCP server in it and it should dish out an IP address for you. Uh, I'm going to call it something, uh, you can call it anything you like, I'm just going to call it RetroNAS. It'll then ask for a domain, uh, you can put in anything you like here, it really doesn't matter. If you've got a domain that you use in your house, if you're a nerd, uh, then put that in there, I've got one obviously. Um, if you don't, it really doesn't matter. All right, now the password part. So I'm going to tick show passwords in the clear so you can see what I'm typing in. Um, this is for the root user. So I'll go through in detail uh, later and I'll put bookmarks in the difference between root, sudo uh, and an unprivileged user. So they're, they're things in Linux uh, similar to Windows, right? Whether you've got an administrator user and a non-administrator user and whether the non-administrator user can be granted rights to elevate themselves to become an administrative user. Same concept at Linux. Uh, I am, for the sake of absolute simplicity, just going to call my, uh, my give my root user the password pi. Um, you've just got to type it in twice. The reason for that is most of my videos that I do RetroNAS installs on, I do on a, a real Raspberry Pi. Um, if you want to simulate that environment, and, and that's what we're doing by installing Debian 11, we can do that for the sake of absolute simplicity, I'm going to put in pi as my root password. Uh, you can do whatever you like here, you can make it as strong as you want, as weak as you want, it's up to you. All right, so now we have to do a standard regular user. This is where a Debian install and Raspberry Pi OS differ. Raspberry Pi OS automatically creates a user called pi. Uh, I'm going to do the same here, I'm just going to call that user pi. Again, you can call it whatever you want, you can give it any name you want, it uh, doesn't matter. You will need to configure RetroNAS to use that user instead of the pi user. Uh, if you just put in the pi user here, it just makes life pretty easy from the, from the RetroNAS point of view, but it's totally customizable, you don't have to do any of this. Uh, this is just the, oh sorry, the previous menu was the um, like the display name. Uh, this is the actual username. Uh, I recommend for both of these making them identical and making them lowercase and no special characters. Um, 
you don't have to do that again but it just removes so much complexity there's a lot of things that can break if you don't um, so yeah just uh, the uh, username there lowercase and again putting in the password so I think the uh, the default password on a Raspberry Pi for the Pi user is the word Raspberry. Uh, I'm going to make mine Pi. So just Pi username Pi password Pi, and again the root user is Pi. Keeps it nice and simple. Um, very insecure, obviously. If you have some security concerns, please you know put something uh, more intelligent in there. This is purely for testing for me. I don't care. Uh, I'm just going to do this to make my life easier. All right, where are you in the world? Uh, I am there. So that just sets clocks and time zones and things like that. Right, now it's going to detect the hard drives in the system. So if you've got a real computer, this might be a little bit different. Uh, if you've got a virtual machine, it's going to be pretty simple. Um, I, I won't go through this. This is sort of advanced user stuff, and it is uh, the the install only, it's not your uh, retro NAS disk, although you might want to set that up in advance, that's fine. For the purposes of this video, this is literally a get yourself into Linux as quickly as possible video. Um, so I'm just going to use this top option guided and just tell it to use the entire disk. I'm not going to uh, do any craziness or petitioning or anything like that. Um, the system will take care of that for me. Which drive do I want? Well, that's the eight gigabyte um, virtual uh, SATA, or it, it shows up as SCSI. Um, but it's the, the disk that we defined at the beginning um, and I'll tell it to use that entire disk. What do you want to do? I'm going to choose the first option again, all defaults, all files and one petition recommended for new users. You can do whatever you like here. Uh, this just makes life nice and simple. And again, we've only got one virtual disk in here and it's a test system anyway, so who cares? Uh, it just tells you what it's going to do um, and you can go back if you don't like it. I'm just going to continue on. Uh, it tells you once again what it's going to do. Are you sure? Are you sure? Yes, I'm absolutely sure. Go ahead. This will destroy data, obviously. So if you've got a, a system that's being used for something else and you want to do clever petitioning and dual booting, be very cautious here. Um, obviously, this is a virtual machine that's brand new and I don't care. If you've got Likewise, if you've got a system that's entirely dedicated to this and is a test system and you don't care, great. All right, now it's going to go and install some base systems. Uh, so that's sort of just enough to build what we've done so far. So configure the users, configure the layout, all that kind of stuff. Uh, once that's done, it will ask us some more questions about extra things that we want to install. So we'll just wait for this to get through. Okay, so uh, now it's going to use a tool called apt, or the advanced package tool, uh, this thing here, apt, to uh, install some more stuff. So if you were on a location where you had the entire Debian catalog on DVD, so it comes, uh, I don't know, I think there's, there's three DVDs and then some supplemental ones, um, and you don't have internet access, you can insert multiple DVDs to do the install. We're not going to do that. Uh, we're just going to select no here. We're not going to look for any more media. Uh, this thing's connected to the internet anyway through the, the virtual networking. And again, because it's an in, a network-based thing, RetroNAS is designed for networks, uh, we're not going to need more need media. It can just go out to the internet and fetch what it needs to fetch. So we'll say no to this. Uh, now this is your mirror chooser. So the idea is that um, lots and lots of servers and services around the world, uh, loads and loads of countries, um, host uh, Linux mirrors, package mirrors. Um, so you can choose the closest one to you, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'm in Australia, so I'm going to grab the Australian mirror, obviously. 
um, and it'll give you a whole bunch of uh, options. So these are all ISPs and organizations that have volunteered to host uh, Debian Linux, which is very kind. This particular one, Arnet, for me is very close and I use it a lot. They're a great research institution um, that are super, super fast. So I'm going to use those. Again, just choose the one that's closest to you. Uh, if uh, you have any sort of uh, doubts. Usually there's a, a mirror based option like this, uh, ftp.au, so the two letter code for my country, uh, you know, yours will be US or, or wherever you are in the world. Uh, that's not a bad option to choose. Uh, it means it's nice and close. It doesn't really matter uh, because we uh, are doing such a small install anyway. We're not going to do, you know, gigabytes of GUI packages and things. So it's not too much of a drama. It won't be too long no matter which mirror you choose. Put in your proxy. So if you do have a caching proxy, uh, you can use that. It's really nice because all the packages come down via plain HTTP. Um, you can use a proxy to um, cache that information. Or if you're sitting behind a proxy, if there's like a corporate proxy or something that you need to get out to the internet, you can put that in here. Um, I do have a proxy. Uh, however, I'm going to leave that blank just for the purposes of this video. So now it will configure apt, the advanced packaging tool. Uh, it will figure out uh, what files are available. It'll scan the mirrors for the latest versions of everything. Uh, it'll do a very small upgrade here. And then it will eventually prompt us for what we want to install next. Okay, so we can optionally uh, take part in what's called PopCon or the popularity contest. Um, this sends information back to the Debian developers to say what packages people are choosing. And what that does, it helps them when they build small CDs with minimal information, it helps them put the things on there that most people select. Uh, now, because it's Linux and because Linux is very privacy focused, this is opt in. So by default, it will never ever send any information. You can opt in, you can choose yes uh, to send that information if you wish, entirely up to you. Uh, you absolutely do not have to. Again, by default, uh, Debian is very privacy focused and will never ever send anything out uh, that you don't uh, manually choose. So I'm just gonna say no, again, just going with the defaults to make life easy. Right, now this is the one part where I'm going to deviate from the defaults a little bit. Now the, the default obviously is to, to install a GUI system. 99% of people want to want to try Unix, Linux and boot into a GUI desktop of some sorts. Uh, I'm going to not select a GUI desktop. Um, you can, you absolutely can if you want to. It just makes the install a lot longer. The tasks that I'm going to do after this are all command line tasks anyway. So the process would be to log into the desktop environment um, and through the desktop environment um, open up a terminal and then inside the terminal type all the commands that I'm going to type anyway. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is install SSH. So SSH is a secure shell. It's a way of getting a remote command line connection into a system. Um, and if you have watched any of my other RetroNAS videos or you plan to, you'll notice I use SSH uh, to connect to my Raspberry Pi and install uh, the RetroNAS utilities via what, what we call a TUI, a text user interface. So it's not a full GUI, not typing commands. It's just a menu driven with the keyboard. Very simple, uh, very lightweight. So we'll, we'll turn on SSH server and we'll leave the standard system utilities. So they're all the, the uh, internal command line utilities that are normal to a Linux system. And we'll just get rid of the desktop stuff. Again, you can choose desktop if you want. I'm not going to. Uh, you'll definitely want SSH server, whether you go desktop or not, turn that on. Uh, the rest is entirely optional. So now it's just going to grab those files from the internet and install them and we'll uh, see what it looks like at the other end.
So for this next section, it wants to install the Grand Unified Bootloader or Grub. Uh, that's the thing that sits out the front of the disk that tells the system how to boot. Uh, Windows has one, it just doesn't tell you about it, hides it from you. Uh, Linux is pretty open about what it does. Uh, so it says, do you want to install Grub? Uh, yes, we do, absolutely, that's how we boot. So we'll say yes. Where do you want to put Grub? Um, so you can enter things manually if you're an expert and know what you're doing. Uh, easiest option is just to choose your primary hard disk. So that's the, the first, if you've got multiple hard drives, the first hard drive in your boot order inside your BIOS. If you've only got one hard drive, then life's really easy. Click that one hard drive. So it's just going to finish up the installation with a few um, installs, making sure that it knows all about your hardware, setting the hardware to auto boot, all those sorts of things. Uh, just run through some more detections uh, and then we're almost at the end. Okay, that's it. Uh, installation complete. It's going to uh, restart the system, eject the virtual CD and be ready to start. So on boot, you'll be given uh, the boot screen here. It'll want to uh, boot into Debian by default. So I didn't touch any buttons there. There's a little, you sort of little countdown uh, come along. So it's actually booting off the virtual hard drive now. So again, if you get the black screen, don't stress too much. Um, it's just the uh, desire to hide things from people and not give them walls of text, which I don't agree with. I'd rather a wall of text. All right, so we get to this login screen. Um, on a Raspberry Pi, it might even auto log you in. You will just end up as the Pi user on the command line. Uh, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to uh, log in as user Pi. Uh, and I've set the password to be pi. Uh, that's what I did in the install video uh, and it'll log you in. Uh, normally what we do at this point is now I'm just going to, if I type in the word clear, simply clears my screen. Uh, same if I hit control and L, it will just clear my screen. So that's, if you ever see that just vanish, um, that's what's going on. Uh, if I run a command, uh, like say the find command, which just finds all the files in my home directory. Um, that's going to spit something out. In Linux, if you prefix the command with sudo, which stands for super user do, um, that will be the same as in a Windows system if you were to right click run as administrator, same sort of thing. Um, so you'll see in a lot of my videos, I start RetroNAS by typing sudo blah. Um, now, the problem here in a default Debian install, slightly different from a uh, Raspberry Pi install, and really this is this is surface level stuff, the core is all the same, the core is all identical, and that's the fundamental part. Uh, these are just configuration items, and we're going to configure them to be more open to what we want to do. Very simple, won't take you very long. If I run sudo find as the Pi user on a default bare bones Debian install, sudo isn't installed. Uh, which is a bit of a problem. It means we can't do administrative level things. So uh, clear my screen. The first thing we're going to do is run a slightly different command. I'm just going to run su. So su is slightly different. Su actually promotes you to be the root user. Uh, the difference is that you need the root user password. So uh, this is where Raspberry Pi differs a little bit. The Raspberry Pi doesn't have a root user password. So one of the first steps you've got to do in a Raspberry Pi is set the root user password using sudo. So it goes the other way. It's got sudo, doesn't have a root password. You've got to use sudo to set the root password. We're going the opposite way. Uh, we're going to uh, use the root password which we set during the install so whatever you set your root password to that's what you type in there uh, and you'll notice my prompt changes now right so up here I've got uh, pi as my user and now I've become the root user the other things you can do is you can type in the word um, id it'll tell you what your user id is or you can type in who am I the existential question uh, and it will tell you exactly who you are if I exit out of there and type who am I uh, I'm pi there so again su put in the root password who am I? I'm root. So from here, uh, we can install sudo and we can use sudo. So let's do that at install sudo. Uh, now this will go out to the internet and fetch sudo and install it.
right so that's done uh, now exit out of here type the word clear who am I so I'm back to the root the pi user if I type sudo find again it will ask me for my password not the root password but the pi password if I put that in uh, what I'll get now is an error saying that I am not in the sudoers file so sudoers is a file that uh, tells the system who has administrative access and who does not. So one more change. So we're going to elevate ourselves to the root user. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is via the su command again. We're going to put a space after it and then a hyphen or the minus sign. Uh, now what that does is that enables the root user to uh, initialize its entire profile and see parts of the system that a regular user can't see. So that's that's an important step. You've got to have that minus at the end there. Put in the root password once again. Uh, and let's have a look at how sudo permissions are set. If we cat, etc. sudoers. So cat is simply a stands for concatenate or just spit something out to the screen. We're going to look at that sudoers file. Uh, and we see down here this percent sudo line. So what that says is the, the percent symbol means a group. So members of the group sudo um, have access to everything. All, 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 all. They have all the options in the world when they want to do sudo stuff. So that's great. Um, if we run ID pi, so that will tell us the groups that the pi member is a part of. That's the full list of groups that the pi user is a member of. Now you'll notice that there are that the the sudo group is not a member of that list, so that's a problem. So I'm just going to uh, clear my screen here. I'm going to type in user mod. So this command will only work if you've done the su space minus um, privilege escalation. It won't work if you use other mods. Uh, minus A for append or add, it's going to add a new group, it's not going to replace groups. Uh, minus capital G, so this is the group that I want to add. I want to add the sudo group and then the user I want to uh, give that access to. So that is the pi user. Uh, if I press return here, that will just uh, work without any errors. If you do get an error here, it's probably because you ran su without the minus at the end. So su space minus to become the root user. Now I'm going to repeat my id pi command. Now what you'll notice there is that the sudo group, uh, group number 27 there in that list, has been added to the pi users groups. So that's great. Pi is now a member of that group which means they have sudo access. So I'm going to type in exit that will break me out of the root shell into the pi shell. Now I have to re-log in to, for the system to know my group so I'm going to log back out again here. It's going to drop me back to this menu. Uh, if I type in uh, pi as my user, pi is my password, uh, clear my screen. So what I did last time was I typed find and that worked and then I typed sudo find and that didn't work. So it's going to ask me for the pi user's password, not the root password, but the pi user's password. I type in pi and the command works. So that executed as the uh, privileged version of the pi account. So this puts me in the same spot as if I was uh, on a Raspberry Pi where I have a uh, pi user with full administrative rights ready to go. So from here I'm going to minimize all my uh, virtualization stuff and I'm going to fire up a terminal. Now you can fire up whatever terminal you like. Uh, this Windows PowerShell thing is the default now for me. Um, you can also just run the command prompt. So if you just type in uh, Windows R to bring up your run dialog, CMD uh, will bring you up with the uh, command prompt. Again, mine, because I'm in this newfangled Windows 11, it's got a slightly different look to what it probably looks like at Windows 10, but it'll work in either of these. Um, what you'll need is the IP address of your actual machine. Uh, so before I minimize that, if I type in IP space A, um, what that will do is it will spit out all my IP information. Uh, there's my IP there. So for me, it is this line here, 192.168.3.181. It's going to be totally different from you. Whatever your home network range is uh, configured as, that's what it's going to be for you. So, so let's SSH into that machine. So type in, in SSH pi at 192.168.3.181. That was the IP address. 
Um, now, depending on how you've configured SSH, I've configured it to just auto add things. You might get a warning that pops up here saying, hey, I've never seen this host before. The fingerprints are weird. What do I do? Um, you literally just, it'll ask if you want to accept that fingerprints, that's a security thing. Just type in YES, it'll accept that security thing. Uh, now it's going to ask me for the Pi user's password. So I type in the Pi user's password. There I am. So I'm now on my virtual machine. Likewise, as I did before, I can either uh, run my find command, that works fine, or I can sudo find and that will work too. So that's pretty much it. We're now at a point where uh, you can go and follow the guides on how to install RetroNAS. Um, but hopefully we understand the basics now. Um, a Raspberry Pi obviously will not let you SSH in as root and you can configure that if you want. Um, this method that I've shown you here essentially gets a default Debian install uh, to the point where um, you can use it exactly like a Raspberry Pi. So more or less this virtual machine, as long as it's running, um, will look, smell, feel, taste exactly like a Raspberry Pi from the network point of view. Because we're bridged on our home network, anything we install here from a retro NAS point of view will act and feel exactly like a Raspberry Pi would. All the menus will work, all the installers will work, all those sorts of things. So if you want to give retro NAS a test, uh, you don't want to dedicate some hardware to it. This isn't a bad option. A little bit of fiddling to get it where you need it to be in order to sort of start your journey. Um, but everything's there ready for you to go. Um, so the important points are uh, remembering the root password that you chose. It may or may not be different to the uh, user. Again, I use uh, username pi password pi for my unprivileged user. I use username root password pi for my administration user. Um, you can use whatever you want. Those passwords might be different. It's the only thing, the only gotcha there uh, if you have done that. And again, setting up, installing sudo, setting up sudo, um, and enabling the Pi user to have sudo access, that's the big one. If you've got that access ready to go, you can now use RetroNAS inside a virtual machine running uh, stock standard Debian 11, uh, and from there on, do as you will. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy RetroNAS.